Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the virtual home of Princeton Public Library here on Zoom. My name is Janie Herman and I am the Adult Programming Manager at the Princeton Public Library. It is my pleasure to host this afternoon's very special Library and Labyrinth live stream author event, our final one for 2021. Princeton Public Library and Labyrinth Books would like to thank Bohem Opera New Jersey and Princeton Friends of Opera for their partnership with us on this event. We couldn't have done it without you. We'd also like to thank Julia Judge from Farrar, Strauss and Giroux for all of her assistance and also the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support. A few housekeeping items. If you'd like to buy the book, I'd urge you to buy it from Labyrinth Book where it is available. I'll be putting the link in the chat if you'd like to order online, but you can also just stop by in person. If ordering online, use the code AUCOIN, A-U-C-O-I-N when ordering, or mention this event when you're in the store to receive a 10% discount. I will mention, according to Julia, that the book is currently in short supply due to high demand, and it is heading into its second printing right now. So that makes Labyrinth an extra great option since they have the books in stock at this time and not everybody does. This note is being recorded and our events typically go up on the YouTube, our YouTube channel within a few days. Both Labyrinth and the library have YouTube channels. Uh, the event this afternoon is one for opera lovers as we host Matthew O'Quan. Oh, I've been saying his name O'Quan in my head and it is O'Quan. Um, so as we host Matthew O'Quan, described by the New York Times Magazine as the most promising operatic talent in a generation. And he has just completed a successful run of his groundbreaking new opera, Eurydice, at the Metropolitan, while simultaneously publishing a book called The Impossible Art, Adventures in Opera, that shares his reflections on the past, present, and future of opera. He is joined today by two friends, Devon Tynes and Peter Sellers, to discuss his book, Opera and Being Creative During a Pandemic. I'll introduce our esteemed guests, and then they will be joining us on screen. During their conversation, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function for any of our panelists to answer, and I'll come on at the end to moderate their uh, Q&A after their conversation. So first up, our guest is Matthew O'Coin, an American composer, conductor, writer, and pianist, and a MacArthur Fellow. He has worked as a composer and conductor with the Met, uh, as well as Lyric Opera of Chicago, American Repertory Theater, Los Angeles Philharmonica, and Music Academy of the West. He was the Los Angeles Opera Artist in Residence from 2016 to 2020, and is a co-founder of the American Modern, Modern Opera Company. And he is joining us from Vermont. And then we have Peter Sellers coming in from the West Coast. Uh, and he is one of the leading op theater, opera, and television directors in the world today. And he has directed more than 100 productions across America and abroad. A graduate of Harvard University who studied in Japan, China, and India, before becoming artistic director of the Boston Shakespeare Company. At 26, he was made director of the American National Theater at the Kennedy Center in DC. And he is currently a professor of world arts and cultures at UCLA, and he specializes in 20th century opera. And finally, our special added bonus guest is Devon Tynes, who is Musical America's 2022 Vocalist of the Year. And he is a path-breaking artist whose works not only encompass a diverse repertoire from early music to new commissions by leading composers, but he also explores today's pressing social issues through work that blends opera, art, song, contemporary classical, spirituals, gospels, and songs of protest as a mean to tell a deeply personal story of perseverance that connects to all humanity. What a great lineup of panelists. So I'm gonna ask them all to turn on their cameras, unmute themselves and join us on screen. I'm gonna to disappear to the background and let these three take it away because I know that in being friends and just in our few moments in the green room, this is going to be absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, all of you for being here. Thanks, Janie, and welcome everybody. Uh, hello, Devon. Hello, Matthew. Oh. <laughs> it's incredible. Hi, uh, Peter, uh, welcome to an incredible Sunday afternoon. Um, and uh, let's just uh, blow it all wide open. Uh, Devon, I know that you are cooking up something inside that mug of coffee uh, that, with those <laughs> super fresh beans from those coffee trees right next to you. Uh, uh, they're in, in Costa Rica. That's not a Zoom background. Uh, yes. I'm actually there. <laughs> but let's start with the caffeination of uh, of Matthew O'Coin's The Impossible Art, this incredible book that was just 
nothing, Matt, you had nothing else to do during the pandemic and you just sat down and wrote it, right? Because you were just bored. And so, uh, and so the, the word impossible is, of course, a good place to start. Uh, and you started there. And then, then what? Then what? And now where are we? Well, yeah, of course, opera is always impossible. But as you said, this, this, this book was uh, one of the few uh, gifts of, of the pandemic. And, and it was written in a moment when, uh, like many other art forms, operas, impossibility had a totally different valence. So um, uh, to, to, to borrow a phrase from an opera you helped create, Peter, it's full of l'amour de loin, you know, love from, from afar, from being far away from the act of performing um, and, and being with other people. So I, I do think it, it could only have been written uh, at, at, at that moment. Um, as for where we are now, I mean, it's, it's a funny thing. Uh, as, as Janie mentioned in the introduction, we just wrapped up a run at, at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. Um, and now I'm uh, in the middle of, of snowy, uh, austere Vermont. And I have to say, uh, uh, those feel like the two extremes. And I, I find myself wanting to uh, find a way forward that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't have much to do with either one. That is neither with um, old world opera nor the absence of performance. And that's one thing I really wanna talk about with you both today is what, is, what are the paths forward for, uh, for this crazy art form? You know, I always think that impossible is the most important thing that we can be doing and that, uh, you know, that's the, what we actually have to explain to politicians is that, you know, they're only dealing with the art of the possible. And I'm sorry, the art of the possible is just not good enough. And and the art of the impossible is actually where our lives are situated. And as artists, we're here to make what is not thought to be possible, possible and to actually bring it into being uh, before your eyes in a process that's super, super hard. And uh, Devon, would you like just uh, bring a, a uh, something beautiful from your impossible collection? <laughs> <laughs> My impossible collection. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I echo, you know, what, what Matt is saying about this particular past year, months, millennia <laughs> being um being a time of just you know how do how do we go on because things have shifted so immensely and i think it's been a really unique time because um it, it's very rare that something so immense affects everyone so much that we all kind of have to shake up our frame of engaging and um one thing that it's been really illuminating for me is the is the possibility of things that we thought were once impossible and you know this entire idea of embracing the impossible how, how do we move forward unless we tr unless we urge or you know yearn to bring into our reality something that we couldn't formally hold and so this time seems particularly open and fertile to that kind of movement it is so weird that people keep saying uh we're going to uh go back to pre-pandemic anything and you just want to say excuse me history has never worked that way you never get to go back <laughs> like since when do you go back you you only history only goes forward and 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 this is actually not a temporary phenomenon this is a completely new era in human history that we are experiencing mm. right now and we're on the cusp of it. And for me, Devon and Matthew, you're creating new work because we're in a new epic moment. And, and in fact, the world needs so deeply, not only to look forward, but to move forward. And, and as artists, one of the things we do is, is not just talk about it, but make something that holds it right in front of you. The thing that you always dreamed of, there it is. Would you just talk about that dream space, Devon and Matthew? Well, I was thinking I, I might, uh, if it's all right with you both, just read a very short passage from one of the, the book chapters that is a little bit of a thesis statement. I've, I've realized it's, 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 it's a section about sort of these laws of gravity that operate in, in this art form, but I, I've realized it's also a way of seeing the world um, more broadly. So. Um, I'm just going to read a very short passage, and and I'm curious to hear both of your, both of your 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 takes. It's a section called "Laws of Gravity." Uh, 
opera is governed by strict, unwritten, irrational laws. These laws are diabolically hard to predict or pin down, but they enforce themselves implacably like the edicts of the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. I think these laws are best articulated as reversals. Reversals between what works in life and what works on stage, between communication through speech and through song. Opera's first law of gravity, the external is the internal. Opera is a highly extroverted art form, sometimes grotesquely so, but what we perceive as abundant exteriority is always the manifestation of an inner state, whether individual or collective. There is no such thing as objectivity in opera. We are always inside someone's head, either an individual's or a crowd's. Total objectivity is surely impossible in other media too, but opera composers, unlike say documentary filmmakers, never had a prayer of creating the illusion of objectivity in the first place. This is a constraint and a liberation. Opera's second law of gravity, there are only three, I promise. In opera, all speech is dream speech, whether it wants to be or not. The dreamlike and the surreal are opera's daily bread, whereas everyday speech acts like making small talk or ordering takeout have a strong tendency to go wonky. The more normal a speech act would be in real life, the more likely it is to sound absurd or unintentionally funny in opera. A world whose atmosphere is made of music is automatically a dream world. And within this world, what is communicated tends to have the unguardedness, the childlike directness of dream speech. It makes perfect sense in opera to lucidly reveal long buried traumas, to confess to shameful desires, to utter curses, prayers, prophecies, wordless primal cries. If they're done right, a listener can take all these things very seriously. An earnest in-depth debate about healthcare on the other hand would make no sense at all. And I'm, I'm not gonna embarrass Peter here by going into detail, but I do talk about the extraordinary way that he makes use of this dynamic in, in Dr. Atomic um, uh, and the way in which characters uttering these kind of inhumanly cruel things uh, are rendered kind of ridiculous sounding merely by the act of singing them. It, it somehow is not possible to sing these things without their villainy being more readily exposed. Um, the third law of gravity, just briefly, is opera transforms pain into pleasure. In opera, happiness is not only a sad song, but also frequently a song of madness or blind, bloodthirsty rage. The whole art form depends on music's power to make pain bearable or even pleasurable, both to the listener and the participating artists. As W.H. Auden put it, the singer, may be part of, the singer may be playing the part of a deserted bride who is about to kill herself, but we feel quite certain as we listen that not only we, but the singer herself is having a wonderful time. The ramifications of this power, this is me again, not Auden, are complex and ethically murky. The line between empathy and voyeurism is an unstable one, and part of the uneasy pleasure of listening to opera arises from a pervasive subliminal uncertainty. Am I empathizing with my fellow human beings or am I just voyeuristically relishing someone else's pain? And as I go into in the book, um, the story of Orpheus and Eurydice is kind of ground zero for this uh, murky dynamic. Anyway, that's just a starting point, but those are, <laughs> those are my laws of gravity. <laughs> yeah. Um... All of those laws, you know, it, it, it's exciting to see them kind of encapsulated that way and so clearly. And so much in that they're laws or a proof of opera's impossibility, it also seems like they're some of opera's greatest values in the same way. You know, um, the, the internal being the external, it being a really special place for, you know, the things that we all hold inside and hidden have a have an actual arena or some sort of space to be engaged um that's something deeply exciting to me you know to share deeply personal held experiences but be able to articulate them with a community of people all working towards opening up that possibility and then speech as dream um you know taking speech 
into a place outside of our normal engagement of it allows for it to hold um, maybe greater and deeper implications. Um, I've been thinking, I, you know, I saw you to see in New York and um, it was really wonderful to take in your work from an external place, you know, just walking into a theater and saying, okay, this, this world that I've, ac I've actually experienced quite from the inside um, and, and your own, you know, my own understanding of your deft um, relationship with speech and that, you know, the, as you go on to, to talk about in the book, um, speech and music being at odds but i really have enjoyed what i now what i more so understand is your implicit entangling of those two things whereas music you know is allowed to be a further deepening of the existence of a word rather than just a buoying aspect and so that law of you know speech is dream is is, op is an opportunity to to bring out a sort of depth and then pleasure or pain into pleasure um, you know, what else is music here for, <laughs> except for that kind of possibility of transformation? Um, you know, the fact that we can uh, go inside, bear our deepest, darkest things, and hopefully turn that into pleasure that comes from catharsis. So, yeah, I really do appreciate the kind of clear outline of those things, because it, it is kind of maybe the, the secret key to why this impossible thing is worth keeping up with. Yeah, and I have to say, Devon, I'm super, Amen. <laughs> like super beautiful. And, you know, I'm really, you know, inspired by you, like most days, just because also what we're searching for is wholeness. And, you know, what all these elements of opera about are is about that all of us are more than the words we say, because the words we say are a pale reflection of who we are and what we're really feeling and what we're really thinking. And so how can we actually represent ourselves and each other as in our wholeness, in all the things that are going on that are spoken and unspoken, that, uh, and when does, when does thought turn into action? And, and music is this incredible way in which your uh, thought becomes an action. Uh, and, and, and so everything's moving from this kind of latent place to this place of coming into the world and all the things you can't touch are suddenly palpable with music and suddenly you're touching things i mean really viscerally touching things that were on the shelf of things not to touch and and so that's really really super beautiful and of course we're all carrying that stuff but you know in a in a hidden away place and who has the key what is the key what, first of all what's the lock and then then what's what's the key and who's holding that, who can, who, who's touching that? So, uh, and for me, Devon, what I'm loving is, is this moment where you're inventing in a whole series of mediums and processes to, to open up into a performance tradition that is large enough, capacious enough to deal with who you are and what you're feeling. And, and to me, that's also, you know, Matt, your project is this, uh, you know, and we're not just trying to add to the list of operas. There's some, <laughs> there's some other project going on right now that I'm feeling so strongly from both of you. Yeah, I like, Devon, what you said about the, the impossibilities also being values, because I, I hadn't quite thought of it this way, but it is also a way of trying to listen to the world of just of not taking it at face value to say okay what what you hear on the radio in the in in the media whatever on a street you know maybe it's not the, maybe the words don't say what they seem to say maybe it is dream space speech maybe you have to listen to the orchestral underpinning of the world around it to get the real meaning, which is, I think, a dynamic in in this art form at, at its best. But um, I do think it's also kind of a, a practice that I'm trying to get better at <laughs> in, in my life. Devon, are you about to jump in there? Thoughts fluttering around, but what are you thinking? <laughs> Well, well, I, I, for me, the, the 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 pleasure is is also um, this this idea of again this interconnected web 
uh, uh, that, as you said, Matt, just holds us together in interpenetrating realities. And, you know, in terms of dream, dream is actually what the world is showing you every day. <laughs> that's the illusion. <laughs> and so we're actually trying to touch something that's a little more real than that. <laughs> and, and that isn't, you know, a series of illusions that are just endlessly disappointing. And, and, and what is it that, that, you know, actually endures and what is, what is endurance itself? You know, uh, what is something that actually we can, we can follow forward and move forward with, uh, as opposed to a bunch of this stuff that you, you, you can't take with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on, on this idea of dreams and dream speech, one thing that I've been thinking about also on this, this lovely trip in Costa Rica, where I have a lot of time to sit down, I've been rereading, um, Don Rose's The Four Agreements, which talks about, um, dreams and, um, and Matt, even in, in working on the No One's Rose earlier this year, you know, this idea of, or what does it mean to hold multiple realities or to respect other realities or other dreams? You know, I think those words can be a little bit interchangeable. Um, and what is opera's pursuit, you know, with all of, all of the confluence of different mediums to create a dream that we can all exist in together? And um, Peter, one of the first times I realized that that was a unique opportunity of opera was when, um, you know, uh, working on Kaya Sariajo's Only the Sound Remains, um, you were saying, I mean, that that piece in particular, you know, it's like a two hour plus journey in, of silence, <laughs> essentially. But, um, you know, and, and through through Kaya's incredible way of, of illustrating, you know, the corners of silence in a way, but that piece one of the goals that I think you articulated being, I'm just inviting people to sit together in a space for two plus hours and just hold some sort of softer, sustained engagement of something. And, and that is something that's only possible through this kind of intentional confluence of, of you know, different, different tools. Yeah. No, so, okay. I've done a bunch of these events around the book and around <laughs> this, this show, New York. And now it feels like, as Janie said, it's the last event of the year. It, we're, we're, we're about to turn this leaf. We're about to enter 2022. We're in this constant state of limbo and uncertainty in our world. And so I really wanted to ask, given that um, I'm lucky enough to be in the presence of you two, um, I want to ask both of you to talk a little bit about what you've been up to these past, yes, these past two years, but I know, you know, Peter, even before the pandemic, I remember having some conversations with you where it felt like the the scope, the nature of, of your work was already undergoing a, a kind of sea change. Um, and then partly because of the constraints of the pandemic, I feel like you both and, and as well as me, we've all had to kind of redefine opera as a meeting place of art forms, but a, a different kind of meeting place, often uh, it, it, within a virtual space, often with fewer people or more far flung people. I'm thinking Peter of your, this body is so impermanent, um, this beautiful, adaptation of the Vimalakirti Sutra, I hope I'm saying that right, um, and Devon, your recital number one, Mass, which is a totally redefined recital program. I wonder if you could each talk about what it is like to collaborate in this moment and what kinds of pieces you feel compelled to make. Devon, do you want to jump or how do you feel? Sure. Um, yes, recital number one, Mass. Um, I'd been on a long journey to figure out what it meant to do a recital, you know, ever since I was in the middle of my studies at Juilliard and it's presented to you as the way that you will, you know, interact <laughs> with the world as a singer, your coming out party or what have you. And it, it, it just, it seemed like a very daunting task because I think I took it pretty earnestly you know, this idea that this is your opportunity to one, show your physical voice through some sort of artistic lens or collected produce of other people. 
Um, and, and it took a really long time to get there. You know, I had a certain phobia of standing in the crook of a piano and being that personal or what being that personal even meant. And so the pandemic specifically, um, you know, like it or not, forced, forced us, forced me to, to sit down and reflect and take time in a very natural way to think, okay, well, what does it actually mean? And instead of saying, like, these are songs I like, these are songs that I, I resonate with, what is this larger, you know, story or this larger framework that is kind of emerging from it? And what can I say at this point of having a time of reflection um, to, to do with it? Um, so this kind of earnest taking on of the task, you know, what what is the actual personal way that I'm choosing to show up in front of people and share something of myself, as opposed to there being the abstraction of, you know, leader and Heine texts or Barry Chanson, what is the very intentional choice or engagement of the materials that be in order to, del to deliver something uh, specific and hopefully honest. Um, and so, you know, titling it <laughs> recital number one, uh, mass, I really wanted it to be engaged as like a thing <laughs> not just like oh this happens to be what's on the docket for today it was like no this is an intentional like thing and um I chose the catholic mass because I thought it was just a really good clear structure you know you ask for help you believe create your curie credo you believe something can happen on you stay you make some sort of sacrifice for change you know I saw if you like dump out kind of the dogmatic or expressly religious aspects of that structure, I think you get a very human tale that um, anybody could map their life story or life interaction onto. And I think that that, that is a hope for, for all musical material or classical music material or opera, you know, how is every individual finding themselves in it at every particular moment and not wanting that to be something left to chance. Um, I think there's a good, there's a great danger of loss or lost opportunity to present uncontextualized things to audiences. And it can be the work of the piece itself or the work of the production or even the work of, you know, the wrappings around all of that to make those invitations. But I think it is something to be consciously thought about. And so, you know, taking this structure of a mass and saying, I think a lot of people have an understanding of what this thing is, but even in my growing up and singing in Catholic church as a church job um, and me trying to just make sense of that, I, I, I often found that people weren't, um, weren't engaging that ceremony for what it actually could mean for their lives. Even though to me as an outsider, it seemed like the most obvious thing. It's like, we are singing for 10 minutes about begging for mercy. So is anybody thinking like, what do I need to ask for mercy about, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, just saying here is a story I think it's a template that we can all find ourselves in. And thus I'm going to choose music, whether that be Bach or whether that be reinterpreted spirituals um, that, that connect to this story. So that if you know that we're talking about, you know, asking for mercy or asking for help, you can hold that reality or that dream for yourself. And I can show you a part of mine. And hopefully between that, we find some sort of connection. So yeah, how to make context or invitations into work explicit has been a big driver in this time. Wow. Uh, Matthew, were you at that recital? Um, I think I've seen early iterations of it, but yeah. I was not the one this fall, unfortunately. <laughs> well, for, for our fantastic uh, uh, Princeton audience, just to say, you know, uh, it happened out here in Los Angeles and it was just an overwhelming, totally overwhelming experience. I mean, the whole, the whole church was, you know, filled with people just riveted. And we were in this state because Devon just opened himself and opened the world to such a powerful place vocally, first of all, by just the call, the incredible call and the powerful call that we're being called, all of us are being called. And Devon, your voice just went there and and the, the call was heard and the call was felt. And then to to activate the mass as not just a, a going through motions, but as you know, really, what are the actions that this mass is suggesting and, and inviting us and or insisting uh, uh, that evening became truly incredible and the intertwining of the spirituals 
put it through particularly charged history that we can we still have no idea how how to deal with and um so i just have to say thank you jovan that was just an incredible incredible experience. thank you thank you very much and thank you i mean i i appreciate you know your illuminating aspects that um hopefully all come together to make that piece something and also though it, it really was just an effort to be honest and direct in in music making through things that exist and some new things and i really just hope that that can become part of the the values or something that's um embraced by anybody i mean yes singers and music making but just what is your connection to this material and hopefully some really beautiful things can come out of it by asking that question um and i guess in that vein matt um what sort of you know personal or um yeah i guess de deeply felt impetus did you have in the creation of eurydice what was that for you as an experience of expression well it was it was actually liberating for me to to engage with a, a story that wasn't mine per se i mean it's it's very personal and autobiographical for sarah rule um who who did lose her father when she was quite young and who wrote the play as a kind of portal into this underworld space to have more conversations with her father um and so i can't claim that any of the the elements of it were particular to my life but i do think um that you know one of the great uh gifts of opera is that it, it's kind of an invitation to compassion, I think, at its at its best. And I, I, I did try to kind of live with the story to an extent that I could, I don't want to say make it my own, but but that I could um, relate to it in this, in this compassionate way and so intensely that I felt really connected to it. And, and then I think you know, we did the piece in Los Angeles like 10 minutes before the pandemic hit. And then we did it just now in New York in whatever state we're in right now. And the difference in reaction among people was so striking because I think um, the proportion of people who had lost someone um, who had uh, who, who, who felt close to grief, close to the other world, um, increased radically. I don't think that's a space that we always live close to in 21st century America, but the, the kind of, um, yeah, visceral response from people of, I've just been in this space, I lost someone, I was trying to picture what it would be like um, to, to meet them face to face. Um, or to, uh, to 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 arrive in the other world or whatever it is. Uh, so for me, I was it's it's kind of like you don't know the what the force of the reaction to something is going to be till you put it out into the world. And I found myself kind of overwhelmed by how close it felt to people this time around. I, I wasn't really anticipating that, but that's one that's one of the mysteries of. Of, of, of doing this thing. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I have to say, for me, it's really clear that, you know, the places that we're, we, we have to help out in are basically recovery and repair and not making a bunch of new stuff to add stuff to the list, but just to say, let's work modestly, but deeply, uh, you know, you know, five, six million people died, you know, at least this last year without being able to say goodbye and no one could say goodbye to them. And what does it mean not to be able to say goodbye? And so uh, my work for the next year at least is all based on creating ceremonies for what was not able to happen and creating ceremonies to say goodbye. I mean, we live also in a period that is a generation where the largest number of people in the history of the world have been disappeared and namelessly erased. And so this general atmosphere of erasure and, and at the same time, the public culture, the newspapers, the media, the politicians have no idea how to acknowledge the weight that we're all carrying. And, and 
and what it means not to be able to touch somebody who you're losing and whisper something to them. And uh, I lost my dad last year, and you know there was no way to get anywhere near him, and no way to you know there's no way to say goodbye. So it's one of those very real things. So a lot of the work I'm doing is about love at a distance, and uh, and the space that music affords, which is the eclipse of distance, which is how close can we get and how close will we always be and how close, how are we carrying someone with us still and in how do we do that? How do we create that closeness and, and call to people and how do we hear them calling us and how do we answer? Speaking further to that, um, one, one of my most formative music making experiences happened during the pandemic and um, con in the context of American Modern Opera Company, you know, that, that Matt co-founded, I'm a, a member of. Um, we had a partnership um, with a hospital who um, had opened up a space for us to, to perform for uh, patients within their their COVID and their cancer um, sections. Um, and it was a really wonderful opportunity just to be one on one. And to say, you know, I'm in a bedroom here, and you're in a hospital room there. And here's something that I can share with you. Um, and a time where that came, became extremely vital was um, when I, I sang this one session and the, the nurses who are incredible and, you know, just warriors in their own right. I mean, wearing hazmat suits, bringing around a laptop and just, you know, who knows what they're, what they're facing, but they're wanting to help hold this possibility of connection. And they give you a bit of context around the person that you're about to see. If they have a certain religious practice or anything that they, you know, prefer. Um, and I was told, um, and Matt, you know, the story, um, this this woman, an elderly black woman, she and her husband had been admitted to the hospital um, earlier that week, and that the night before, her husband passed away, and he was in a completely different unit than she was. And because of COVID, um, she wouldn't be able to see him. No family was allowed to come to the hospital, and it became very clear very quickly, you know, what this music making would would be. Um, for her or for both of us even, which was some sort of acknowledgement or ceremony um, that would put this person to rest. And in terms of, of a ritual or ceremony, I, I immediately drew on music that I, I sang growing up in the Black Baptist Church, music um, of funerals, you know, different hymns and and all of, all of that kind of, those regular, sounds that we hear in order to uh, engage that. And so, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to express because I, every single word, every single breath, every single choice became so hyper vital, um, even so much that like even to think of them self-consciously as musical or textual choices seemed um, absurd, seemed self-interested. you know, interested. And it was like, how can I immediately cut this this uh, wall of you know artifice of expression and really just do what I know how to do in my bones? And so, yeah, that sort of you know newly framed vitality of music making, especially in this time. And um, Matt, definitely within Eurydice, this idea of you know how do you deal with um, un <laughs> unfathomable loss. Um, the fact that you know we have an opportunity to make these rituals, to make these spaces for those things to be engaged, it's it's really special because where else does that exist? It's true. I'm so glad you brought that up, Devon. These we've been doing it what almost every week for is it over, over a year now? I have no over sense. Year, of yeah. um, and I do think that's one of the great innovations of this time is. These are one-on-one -on -one concerts. One, we never used to do that. We never used to, it, it would seem somehow 
inefficient or something to give someone a one-on-one -on -one concert in the before times. And now we sort of had to. And like you said, it's, it, it, it is direct and meaningful in a way that uh, larger scale things can't be. It is so, it is the most intimate thing. Um, and so I do hope we, we, we keep that, these kind of uncanny spaces um, where, you know, new kinds of communication are hopefully, hopefully possible. Most of the history of music has been in intimate conditions and has been in people's houses, has been in people's kitchens, <laughs> has been on the porch, has, you know, I mean, that is most of the history of music, you know, up to Johannes Brahms. You know, it was really, it's, it's how intimate can we be? And this music is creating this sense of intimacy and this sense of how deeply we're together and how deeply we're moving together and feeling together and and that our space is is not my space and your space, but it's our space. And that's really a. I think you know we it's strange, but in America, the twentieth century, it was all about larger and larger and larger and and broadcast and and all of that. And I think it's a beautiful thing to come back to how intimate how intimate an experience can we have right now. I'm obviously getting kind of intimate with a with a dog here. Excuse me. Um, I think it is about time to open things up to all the participants um, for a Q and A. Um, Janie, should should folks put it into the uh, either the chat or the Q and A box? It looks like. So. Yes, uh, people can put it in into either place. We don't have any questions, and I'm I'm encouraging them to do that. So. Um, but so I did have a, a question while we wait and I'm gonna, I'll bring, I'll bring myself back online. And usually Princeton audiences don't have a problem coming up with questions. So I'm hoping someone's gonna join in. If not, we can just keep, um, keep chatting. So I, I really, this whole conversation about, um, you know, personal concerts and making new ceremonies and for closure and, um, you know, I don't know anybody right now who hasn't been touched in some way by this pandemic um, and, and, the, and the whole concept of having to say goodbye without being able to say goodbye to losing a loved one. And we lost my mother-in-law very early, very, very early in the pandemic without being able to say goodbye and being able to have any kind of ritual or funeral for her. And it was very, very hard. And so I want to thank all of you for doing this work and for recognizing it. And I'm sorry for your own loss, Peter. It's, it's been a challenging year. Um, with that in mind, do you, th I, I just want to ask, when do you feel like, I feel like we just reopened and now we're, we're retreating, um, you know, already the Rockettes closing down their show and, um, you know, people are going back. So do you feel like this is going to, are we, are we going to have another complete closure of performing spaces? Are people going to be comfortable? How are you? Is there talk in your world about that? What's going on? Do you have you heard heard any talk? No. Well, I if I could say one of the one of the things that was always a little annoying about classical music is as we were growing up, somebody was the expert and knew everything and could answer every question. And the beautiful thing about COVID is now nobody knows what's next. Yeah. There's nobody who's the authority. We're all going day by day, which is kind of like a medieval way to live. And, and actually, it's a, it creates humility. It creates openness. It creates we're no longer operating by formula. We're no longer operating uh, just by, by, by the book. But there, there's, we're writing the book. And, and so, so for me, that's really beautiful. And, and again, uh, that, that, that we're having to develop new relationships and that the arts are no longer in an arts center, but the arts are everywhere else because mm -hmm. there is no art center. The art center is the human heart. So it's not a, a, a big building for people who like art. And so what we're doing is moving into every world and, and, and that the arts are present in every world. 
is is really important for the artists <laughs> as well as for every world and and i think that's a an amazing time and that we have to be careful and take care of each other and take nothing for granted in every interaction is a miracle it's just is so beautiful and and real and yeah. scary but also you know suddenly we have to be aware and that awareness is already powerful uh because care is the main thing that's needed and we need a culture of care you know that's that's actually the, what the work of the 21st century is about is is creating cultures of care and uh as there's a there's a sign on uh, on a house that i pass every morning uh on, on the front that says you know care not cops you know mm -hmm. can we have structures of care instead of structures of um containment and 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 repression and can we redirect our budgets and redirect all of our institutions in completely new objectives uh, and how does medicine you know stop being simply scientific and start being social and start being emotional and start being recognizing the total human being i mean this is not a, an idle question every every hospital is in the middle of these questions right now is all the ways in which we need to communicate to stay alive. And we have to get better at all of it. You speak so much truth there. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we do have a few questions coming in that are more opera related back from this very emotional, I felt very emotional when you guys were talking earlier. So let's go back to a little bit about opera. Uh, this is from uh, Takasa. All about Bento. opera, sorry. Um, and she wants to know about the uh, about the element, um, if any of you, I guess, but maybe more towards Matt, talk about the element of performance and how the energy generated between performer and audience uh, plays into the impossible art form. So how is it the, the energy generated between performer and audience? How does that play into what you're calling the impossible art form? Great. And I will also address, I think there's one question above that, uh, which I'll, I'll answer as well. Um, yeah, you know, I think there's a funny thing when you're a composer, which is that you, you imagine what a piece is going to sound like, but of course, every human voice is a totally singular <laughs> instrument and people's souls are totally individual and it's always a shock. It's always a physical shock um, to experience a piece in, in real time. And I think, you know, the, the flip side, and I, I, I do talk about impossibility, which might sound pessimistic, but I really mean it in the most utopian and optimistic sense, because part of the point is you never achieve the thing you were going for, but usually something that's much messier and more interesting happens instead. And I think that just the act of performance is the best example of that, that you could never have actually imagined these individuals, you know, these <laughs> physical presences on stage, the weight of this voice, the, pa the passion, the things that people find through chemistry, just human chemistry. Um, so yes, I think that's the best illustration of the, the productive impossibility. And I see there's a question from Pat O'Connor just above, do, do we feel that operas and recitals, et cetera, will need to be shorter? I think this is a question similar to the one Peter answered that it's just nobody knows. But I, I, I personally don't think there's gonna be any kind of blanket single response of now everything is 70 minutes long. I do think it's gonna be highly case by case. It's like, can you go outside for an intermission? Can people just go somewhere into open air, et cetera? It's, it's, I think the, the array of, of, of human creations is not gonna get any narrower just because of this disease, put yeah. it that way. Uh, and so then uh, Jerry from, uh, Jerry Kalstein from Bohem Opera, New Jersey, wanted to know about the use of the three stones in Eurydice and did it arise from the trio um, in Trouble in Tahiti. Hello, Jerry. No, I'm, I'm afraid it didn't. Trouble in Tahiti is not one of my favorite pieces. Um, however, I mean, there are three, 
you know, there are three Rhine maidens, there are three of, of, of boys and spirits and ladies in the magic flute. There are, there are a lot of trios and, um, you know, they existed in the play even before it was an opera. So I'm not sure that the inspiration was even musical, but they are sort of these, they're these irritating sort of bureaucratic presences in the underworld. I've, I've come to sort of think of the stones as being sort of like these, these Kafka-esque bureaucrats who um, they, th their job is to keep people from feeling anything. Their job is to keep the dead from en engaging with their emotions. And so really they're the kind of force of banality that, that Eurydice has to wrestle with. And I do think this, there's, there's a lot of stone energy in, in the modern world that we all have to <laughs> be very resistant to. So, so I'm not sure where they came from. It's also a question for Sarah. Thanks for asking them. Yeah, because uh, that that the, yeah, the original play by Sarah does have those three stones in it, and it's uh, you know the original play is. I mean, how closely did you follow then the uh, original play in the in the opera? Would be a, a for those that have seen the play, which I've seen the play you know performed twice in different um, plays. So I'm just wondering how closely are you following that then? Well, you know, it is not the length of a Shakespeare play, so which means that we did not have to throw out 85% of it to get down to libretto size. It was a much subtler process of, of winnowing it down. Um, we did make some noticeable changes, such as the presence of Orpheus's double, the, the representation of Orpheus as two singers with a kind of split voice is, is certainly something that's unique to the opera. The other really funny thing that I noticed after the fact was, I think we cut almost all the references to music in the play because um, it doesn't make as much sense to talk about music in an opera um, because everything's made of music. So it sort of becomes superfluous. But yeah, no, it was, it was a relatively painless surgery, um, if I can put it that way. Okay. Uh, so Lynn Becker wants to know, again, this goes back to, you know, the private concerts that Devon is giving and, and this whole, you know, whatever else, but um, the redefining of everything. Uh, in the midst of a pandemic this year, um, we such wonders as Eurydice and Innocence have arised and a lot of streaming, which provides opportunities in terms of intimacy and seeing actors, singers close up. Uh, so for all of you, will this maybe redefine how operas and musical experiences are produced from now on? And will it influence in-house experiences? And that kind of goes along with the next person who's wanting to know who's talking a lot about the live in HD from the Met and how, you know, during um, intermission, now you even get to watch the set be moved around and get interviews with people and just how vividly they convey the impossible infrastructure necessary to bring it off. Um, so do you think these things, they want to, could this kill live opera? Which I don't, I mean, I personally don't think, I mean, you can't, I've seen opera on the screen and I, I mean, there's just nothing like seeing it in person, but that's just me. So, Devon, yeah, you look like you got something to say there. <laughs> I, think it has to, I think it has to do something with um, how we engage the tools of the medium. So towards the beginning of the pandemic or the huge shift, you know, um, we, we could only do things virtually. And I, I took a, a personal beat to think, how, how do I do that? And I found myself saying over and over again, you know, at least for right now, the computer screen is the proscenium. Like, let's just accept that. And let's accept that this camera is an eyeball and that we have to interact in that way. And I think there are other, you know, worlds of media um, in different realms, popular or what have you, that um, have, have been uh, interrogating these tools for a, a while and they have a certain way of using them or access, accessing them. And just insofar as, you know, it's a new toy um, for opera, this kind of expression, it warrants that kind of research and development and who knows how long that will take, but it at least takes, I think, um, in honesty with what the medium is and not saying that it is implastic as opposed to what it's trying to represent. They in fact are conduits, you know, for each other or a further tool to add to, you know, the confluence of, of art forms, you know, this impossible com combination that Matt talks about. Um, but also in terms of how that might inform live performance, um, I think it just means a broadening of the landscape of modes of expression. And I think there are things that will never 
um, you know, approximate or replace live performance. I mean, the, the question about what is the energy between audience and performer in this impossible art form, I think for me personally, as a performer, that's one of the most ex exhilarating, special, un un unfully knowable things, you know? Um, I've started to feel or experience the connection between audiences and performers as like a material um and sometimes it's really special when it's like you and the audience together have created something that actually you you can feel or move um a certain density that certain musics or opportunities make and um that is something i think that is only tangible with bodies in a similar space so you know finding like what is the that why do we miss intimacy what is it about that that we want to hold on to and hopefully hold it more preciously when or if we get to have it and then if we're in another form just to be honest about what those tools are and how we're engaging them I'd love to just answer this from a slightly different angle too, which I touch on in the book, because I think there's this really deep seated fear in the human psyche that the technologies we invent will control us or destroy us. You know, we fear that Google Maps will destroy the part of our brain that knows directions, you know, maybe rightfully so. Um, but I, and, and I think that the way that it manifests in opera is often that if we watch things on a screen, then we will just suddenly lose the desire to make music in this way at all. And I think this is a totally overblown fear. I mean, big opera houses are so ruled by this terror. They're so afraid of like Marilyn Horn showing up with a sledgehammer outside their front door, you know, whenever they do something that uses amplification. And I'm personally, I'm such a fan of having it both ways. You know, I, I really believe that we should continue these ancient practices of cultivating these powers that exist within the human body and the human spirit to amplify in the best sense our voices, um, which is something that you can do um, with, with no electronics. But then given that we have these tools and we can create these experiences, it would be ridiculous not to use them. So personally, I am a fan of, of having it both ways and creating the optimum audio experience for whatever the situation requires. And I think that um, often in opera, we sort of shoot ourselves in the foot when we say that, you know, this sometimes frustrating experience of sitting in a distant balcony and not really being able to, the orchestra sounds distant, whatever, pretending that that is the ideal is ridiculous. And I think we need to get over it immediately. <laughs> so that's just my take. And and I really want to be in Costa Rica with you, Devon, right now. But I'm just so beyond thrilled to be with you now on Zoom. I just is totally exciting to be with you. I'm like so moved, and so I'm like grateful. I'm grateful yeah. for every glimpse. And and everybody talks about you know going back to the before times, as if we're going to revert. Um, no, and uh, Peter and, and the Green one we were talking about, we can only go forward. We can't, you know, time doesn't move backwards. And um, we're going to only move forward. And, you know, I, I think three years ago, this as a library program in this form could not have happened. We couldn't have had Peter coming in from California and Matthew and Matt up in Vermont and, uh, you know, Devon in, in Costa Rica and me here in Princeton and all these people coming together behind the scenes to promote it and, and you know, people it just it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been and so this pandemic uh, forced a lot of places to think new ways especially libraries we had we had about a month to figure out how we were gonna you know keep doing what we do to bring books to people to bring author events to people and you know having people in our community room you you know i wouldn't have been able to get you three in our community room very easily but here we are having this wonderful conversation and so yes we can only go forward we're going to end with this final question from Julian Grant, who says, was Pierre Boulez right? Should the idea of the 19th century opera house be exploded and maybe even the overperformed European repertory core be blown away for opera as an art form to move forward and to find a truly new flavor? So I think that's a really great question. I it's got a lot packed into it. <laughs> yeah. Um... One thought that comes out was um, in terms of defining, you know, what opera is it, it, it part of the book, Matt, where you're talking about it's important to bring in new voices. 
Um, and what might we have lost by not having space for certain voices? And that start and and uh, also talking about Jesse Norman and saying, you know, maybe the greatest aspiration, at least in her time, was to be able to sing the music of <laughs> dead white men from Europe to its highest quality. Um, and this might be a very circuitous answer, but <laughs> it made me think about um, this project I'm working on with the violinist Jennifer Coe. Um, we've been getting to know each other for the past uh, five years and making this piece that is about us meeting each other in the midst of a very white institution and working within it and what that has meant. And we, a principle of the story that we've been trying to tell, which connects to us interviewing our parents and so on, is this idea it takes three generations to make an artist. Um, the first one to drag the family out of poverty, the second to educate, and then the third has the freedom to become an artist. So I, I see a little bit Ms. Norman's comment in the context, um, in her historical context, maybe in that middle part of what does it take to make an artist, you know, okay, we're, we start from being um, pre being present in the form, you know, oh, there are black singers Two, We mastered singing European works or whatever, my parent, Jesse Norman in a way. And now I get to um, delve into so many other facets of making because, you know, in minority perspectives, you have to prove a certain level of something before you can run free or rampant. And, um, I'm kind of forgetting the overall point of why I'm saying this, but I think, oh yes, in order for opera to move forward <laughs> in a certain respect, it's like, well, where are we going now that certain people have reached, you know, certain comfortability with the creation technically of certain things or the, you know, um, respect of delving into certain aesthetics in making something more diverse or giving opera new flavor, as you're saying, I think it start it makes us walk towards this very scary question or question that's really scary to some people, you know, what does it mean to say we need to make opera more diverse when in fact it's a form that was built of a very specific context? So in order to move um, whatever the values of this thing are, you know, the ability to hold dreams together, the ability to make uh, pain pleasurable or what have you, it's not just about defining what are the values of this particular art form as we know it in some sort of linear progression. There has to be a point at which we look beyond that particular definition to find something else based on those values that we think are important. Suffice, sufficient to say like, what is inviting a diverse voice to a place that hasn't even um, explicitly defined its own values. I would love for us, you know, as an artist community within opera to at least speak to each other as we're doing now about these, you know, deeply held and intrinsic values so that we can th think about how to invite other people to that. You know, we can't invite people into a world of creation if we haven't even spoken to each other about why it's important. Wow. Very roundabout, but there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The three generation image is so powerful and really resonates to I hadn't thought of it quite in that way, but I think that is totally. Yeah, I mean, what you were saying about, you know, Ms. Norman really made me think like, how does this work as an arc? <laughs> yeah, because she was working with what she had and she did bring it forward. And now you're bringing it forward from that place, which is, which is, which is amazing. Just to touch, briefly on, on on the question and that, you know, that line, oh, gosh, it's really getting dark where I am, isn't it? I'm just gonna slowly kind of disappear. Um, you know, I, I don't think Mr. Boulez really proposed an alternative is the problem. You know, he said he wanted to blow up those opera houses, but also he didn't quite, um, he wasn't quite willing to engage with the inner lives of people, which I think is, a, re a, a requirement for opera making. So <laughs> I'm not one to say, let's throw it all out and not propose an alternative. I do think though, that we need to uh, radically change the proportions of what we think is, you know, important to hold on to versus what new work, what new energy we need to bring in. I think it needs to be 
the vast majority of, of what we're doing needs to be new work and new energy. And when it comes to this tradition we're a part of, you know, there, okay, there are some pieces where if you want that experience, you want that thing, you really have to go to this one piece. You know, some of the, you know, some of the Mozart operas or Berg's Lulu or whatever. It's like, those are experiences. It's worth taking the journey to go there. But do we need to spend our, our all of our time holding up this weight uh, of tradition? I, I, it's not, it's not the top of my my priority list. Let me turn on a light here. Peter, over to you. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, just to say, uh, Matt, as you just said, I mean, one of the things about Pierre, as brilliant as he was, is that he never wrote an opera because uh, he didn't have those those sensors open, uh, uh, those human dimensions uh, uh, in his practice. Uh, but just to say, um, most of the history of opera at any given time in the history of opera, most of the operas being performed, or in fact, all of them are new, just like film. You know, it would be very weird if, you know, what's at every movie theater is some film from 1922. You know, it, it just, that would be weird. You know, most people are alive and interested in new things every day. And so that's the normal, normal, normal thing. And, and it was all through Mozart's lifetime, through Verdi's lifetime, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I actually think the 20th century was a very strange moment where also the opera repertoire was fixed and frozen. Um, and if I can just be, you know, annoying for one second in 1925, when Stravinsky and Schoenberg were declared the most important people on earth, who were selling the most records on earth, Louis Armstrong and, and, and Bessie Smith. So excuse me. And what was it that suddenly those people were not included in this project? So it's a very weird thing that the 20th century, I think, warped the opera tradition. And I think the 21st century, we can rejoin reality and, um, and just, enjoy ourselves in much, much wider uh, spectrum. And, and also, you know, the budget cuts are real. And frankly, you know, a lot of opera was built at a time when you didn't have to pay a violinist and when the age of empire was going full blast. Uh, this is a different time and there are not gonna be the budgets to do a lot of things. And in fact, also for one art form to take the entire arts budget uh, is not exactly democratic practice. So I think we really have to live differently. And I think living within our means is actually an amazing invitation. And, and to, I think the height of creativity in most eras is when there was no budget and people had to reach in and find um, a way to communicate and a way to pull something from themselves that was valuable and had value in other terms than money and and created a shared space. And I think we're really looking to do those things urgently right now in the early 21st century. And whatever forms those things take will be precious. That's a really great note to end on. And I just wanna say, we've already gone over our hour, which I kind of suspected we might, but that's just fine. We are not bound to an hour here. We we can we can we can make our own rules. We are in the twenty first century. Uh, so thank you all of you for taking time out of your afternoons uh, to join us here. And um, Matt, congratulations uh, during the congratulations talk, Matt. <laughs> yes, congratulations uh, during Matt. during the talk. Um, I at the top of the talk I said, um, oh hey, go get your book at Labyrinth because they thought to order. Uh, cases before it started selling out and having to go to reprinting. Uh, but Dorotea typed into the chat that uh, your last copy just sold from her store as well, but she's taking orders. Um, and I have a message from Julia Judge at, for at FSG saying that they're putting through the second printing and those copies will go out soon. So congratulations. Well, very hard to believe. Thank you everyone. I mean, reading. your book just came out for December 9th and it's going into a second printing. I mean, congratulations. Um, and it is, it's, Mine's such like a valuable addition to um, thinking about opera. I mean, I'm just so. I mean, you've 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 had a great 2021 between you know premiering at the Met and a great book and 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 Devon 2022 is going to be your year and and Peter, you're here just 
being your fossil, legendary but self. It's good. It's good. It's good. I'm with you're just here being people. your legendary I'm with self, beautiful helping young people. <laughs> you know, yeah. People. <laughs> and I love to see. I just love to see the you know the chemistry that's happening and the creativity. And I'm looking forward to what's going to come in the future. And um, you know, maybe one day uh, you'll come down to Princeton for the Princeton Festival for us, or something will happen. Something magical will happen there. I'm not sure what. But we do have the wonderful Princeton Festival each June. Uh, as well as the PSO, the Princeton Symphony Orchestra, and our friends at Princeton Opera and the Bohem Opera in Jersey. We're, we're a really good opera center in Princeton, just saying. You know, if any of you want to come visit us, the, uh, the uh, door is open. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, and with this, we're going to end our program for the afternoon. And um, I can see the chat coming in, everybody saying what a great program this was. And there were several private comments from people saying how, how touching they found this and thanking all of you for coming on to be here with us this afternoon. So this is the awkward part where we all just wave goodbye and go off into uh, Never Never Land. So thank you and goodbye.